1984 that helped us out a lot with all our dogs there. And what it was is the dog has to alert to a track just like a dog alerts to narcotics or bomb or, or termites or mold. I don't care what it is. You've got to have some type of alert to be able to read your dog what's going on. So after I came back from Germany going to school over there, and of course the Germans don't believe in trailing. They don't believe dogs can trail. When Matt was talking about them tests, then what the Germans did with the, with the wheel and all this, they only believe a dog can track ground disturbance. Which basically in this country we've proved that to be wrong. But the main purpose for this is I started teaching my dog to down just like he did on evidence when he found a track. Because what's one of the biggest problems we as police officers run into when we go out when we go out on a on a uh, a track. And I think you all are going to know what I'm getting ready to say. You go out there and a guy says, okay, this guy just pulled on robbery, whatever it is, and he took off and he ran that way. Okay. Now you're going to go out there and try to find the track. And one of the first things I had to start doing that I found out in my own county is my, police, my own officers were my worst enemies. Because I would say, did you chase him out there? No, sure didn't. And why would they say that? Because we gave a class in the beginning to our officers where we said set up a perimeter, do not give chase if you're going to use a dog because we don't want to track contaminant. So the officer basically lies to us. Said, no, I didn't do that. And then I started learning what happened as I'd go out and run a track, my dog would find it, and we'd go and we'd track out about 100 yards, and guess what? We came right back and went right to a door of a patrol car. And then there I go, oh yeah, I did run out there. And so you want to look at their boots. I always looked at the officer, whoever was on scene there, said, let me see your boots before I took off. So I knew if I got on the track, I was not tracking their boots, I was tracking something other than that. That was the first thing. But what we did um, with this system was we developed where our dog, we would pull up to a scene, and I'd ask an officer to run a track for me in training to where our dogs got this good. I would pop the back door, because we didn't have door openers back then, tell the dog to go find Zook. The dog would go out on his own, find the track, and down. Now, what's important about that is, that dog just told me, just like he does for narcotics or a bomb, that he found a track. It might not be the right track, because we don't know in a foot chase or whatever, but we do know he found a track. Another thing I adopted was, and I'm going to tell you guys, it takes six months to do this. Because I did it, and, and, and it's tough. It's teach my dog to track off leash. Why? Because it's tactically safe for me. If my dog is off leash and tracking at a nice slow speed, I can sit back here, because I don't know how you guys were, we carried guns on our thighs, with flashlights, and I can sit back here like this, and I'm tactically safe with a backup team. Instead of having to hold on to a leash, have a flashlight in his hand, and doing this bullshit out there. So, but that is very advanced tracking. But it's important as a police officer that you do that. And why? Because you don't survive by luck. You survive by design and skill. Never luck. If you go out there thinking you're going to survive by luck, then let me tell you something. You will get hurt. Always by your design you do for your dog and your skill as a leader and as a handler. That is very, very important. Okay, enough about track. Police service dogs. One of the biggest problems, I don't care where I go and I do seminars, we run into is the basics of this right here is not in fly. And what happens was you get a lot of vendors sell dogs to people and you got a handler that really doesn't know what he's getting. He knows it's a dog, and that's about it, and he's happy to be there, and he wants to go, go uh, be a handler and get a skill up. For detection dogs, you must have these four drives. If them four drives are not there, your dog will not be successful. It was, and let me tell you this right now. Normally, this is not a handler problem. A lot of people will go back and say, or your dog screwed up because the handler screwed up. If this dog has these drives at 95% or above in each level, 
prey drive, hunt drive, play drive, and impact drive. If these, do if these drives are there, that dog should be found built by himself. And one of the first things we always do when a new officer comes here is we'll usually just turn the dog loose and let him go watch the dog find dope by himself or bomb. And then I go, now look, that dog doesn't need you, so don't interfere with him. Because what you are is you're like a tow missile system. There's a cable that, that goes on that tow miss missile system and guides it as long as you aim at the target and keep your X on it, it guides it to the target and as a dog handler, that's what you are. Don't interfere with your dogs. You are nothing but a guide to make sure you give the dog opportunities by putting his nose in places to do what he needs to do. That is the most important factor that we do. I guarantee you, everybody in here, I know just about everybody, you could just go into a room, follow your dog, and what your dog will do, you'll go find the dog. Okay. First of all, always remember that. Because what we see handlers do a lot of times is they interfere because we're cops. What's the, biggest, what's the biggest thing we're taught? Be suspicious of everything. So we see a dog doing something and, and we get out there and we go, oh, well maybe, I, maybe, maybe uh, Tom didn't hide the dog. We start getting stuff in our mind that's crazy. One of the worst things I found out when I first came back from Germany and at that time, I had the only drug dog in this state. There was no other drug dog in the state of Kansas. And I was getting called out in Wichita for the DEA task force and everything down there. And back in them days, we trained our dogs on quaaludes, cocaine, and believe it or not, even methamphetamine back then, plus white crosses. White crosses is a big drug. And of course, marijuana. Now, I, I went into a house for Wichita PD and KBI and DEA. And my dog goes in and indicates on this dress, dresser drawer. And I was taught in Germany, which is we found not to be, and we don't do this anymore, but to stimulate my dog on every time he found dope. So my dog hits this drawer, I throw the ball, and, and then we go on and evidence tech comes along, opens the drawer up, there's quaaludes in there, and there was also like, thousands of black beauties. That was a barbiturate back in them days. That was a prescription drug, but illegal, if you didn't have a prescription. And I don't think anything about this, because I, I wasn't taught anything any different, so you learn from the street. So I go on and search the rest of the house, and, and we get nothing else. About three weeks later, I'm again in Wichita, doing a search warrant, and my dog goes along, and hits this, remember the old big uh, headboards on the back of water beds? And hits this thing, and we, of course we had a dress and alert back then, and I throw the ball without even knowing what's there. And my dog gets his ball and he's happy and he's playing, and we open it up, and guess what's there? Black Beauty, that's it. Nothing else. No other drug, nothing else. So what did my dog learn on the first search I did three weeks before that? When I gave him the ball, he learned black beauties are just as good as quaaludes. He was only training on quaaludes. He was not trained on black beauty. So here's our problem. They now have, it used to be when I went to school in Germany, we trained four drugs at a time, four bombs at a time. Because that was back in, in, the, in the early 80s. That was a thing. They said dog to smell and desire for four odors at a time. Auburn University, and Amsterdam American University in, in uh, Holland have now proven that it's way over 25. So when I have a scent picture and I put my drugs out or whatever I'm doing, bombs, drugs, it doesn't matter what detection work you're doing. When I put that out, it forms what's called a scent picture. So in that scent picture can be numerous items, depending on how I train. If I put it out with my hands, what do I do? I put it out with my scent on, didn't I? Okay. If I put it out with gloves that are latex and got powder on them, I put it out with the dog also smells the latex and smells the powder. That's why you want to use clear gloves like you get uh, 
you see at restaurants or cooking places, they're just clear gloves. That's the least amount of sink gloves there is. There's no powder on them, there's no nothing like that. <clears throat> because whatever's in that sink pitcher, you go teach your dog. This is where handlers screw up on the street. This is why we're talking about this. You never, never stimulate, or guys want to use the word reward, I use the word stimulate. Reward your dog on the street. Why? You don't know what's there, that's why. So if you stimulate on the street, you're teaching your dog whatever is there. So let's just use, for example, that there's a cooler in the trunk, it's got 10 pounds of marijuana in it, it's got hamburgers in it, it's got hot dogs in it, it's got potato chips in it, everything that this guy's taking camping with him along with all his nice little drugs, and my dog goes along and hits on it and I throw the ball or throw whatever toy it is your dog plays with. You just taught your dog that hamburgers are okay, hot dogs are okay, potato chips, Coleman coolers are okay. Every bit of that, you just surmise to your dog is great. So that's why we never see them on the street. Dog hits it on the street, that's it. I don't even like to say good boy or good girl. Away I go, do my thing, and then if I'm done in three hours or four hours with my paperwork or whatever it is I had to do, I will then take my dope that I know what it is, go hide it or have another handler go hide it, and then work it and then stimulate the dog. Now in training, you have to make sure you do this too. Now here's the old question you always get when we're teaching as people raise their hands and go, well I gotta stimulate my dog every time or my dog won't find dope. If your dog has the proper drive, right here, you train through prey drive, hunt drive, play and pack, you could go do 50 fines in your dog and never stimulate him and the dog will still go and search. Why? Because he has a drive. He's not going to quit. Dogs are avid gamblers. The dog is going to continue to search. If it has a proper drive, it's going to search. The old attic in the old days used to be, if I did a building search, same thing, and we didn't find anybody in the building, First thing we wanted to do, because that's what we were taught, was go hide a guy in the building and let the dog go in and bite him with a sleeve on. Why? Because we go, my dog has to do that. That is not true anymore. With the high drive dogs that we have, we do not need to do that. Nor do we need to do with dope or bomb or whatever. You should be able to put out as many as you want, and your dog finds them, and the dog will continue to sniff continue to work because he has the drive. He expects, when's it coming next? When am I going to get my, my, my toy? Now, how many people in here believe that a dog knows what a ball is? I hope none of you, because dogs don't know what balls or toys are. That, that is prey to them. That is nothing but a rabbit. And, and what happens in that given case is, is a dog learns that the leadership, which is us, pack leaders, we're the leadership, allows the dog to kill it when it finds it. It gets to get its prey and it gets to kill it because we allowed it to happen. So that's what the dog looks forward to. But it doesn't, what you want to make sure in, in your dog's mind, it does not know when it's going to happen. A lot of the new things have come along, we're doing all the passive alerts now. And we're getting what? High focus? Focus from our dogs, that's what we want. Focus. Where the dog sits, I can pull back on the line, the dog says, screw you, it's here, I'm not leaving, I'm here. That is confidence for you to be able to call, there's dope. In the old days, it was the aggressive response, so we did all kinds of things where we, the dog was scratching and we'd pull the dog's tail and pull him back and pull-ins and pull-outs and all this to make sure the dog would peel paint off cars. So I, as a handler, knew, boy, my dog got that one, but then what happened? The next thing we know, we're painting a car. Because what happens is, as we all know, this Joe Blow transports his ounce of meth in the back seat over to 121 North Street and takes it to his buddies and then I come along, I make the traffic stop, I run my dog on it, there's no more dope there, but there's what? Residual odor. And my dog is going to hit residual odor, and my dog peels the paint off his car. 
and we, do, we search it and we don't find anything. So what you need to do is keep doing your follow-up investigation on that. This is what we did. First two that we did, you know, my sheriff was like, God, Jesus Christ, why would we have to fix this car? So I said, well, you know what, we need to do further investigation. We bring the asshole in and say, all right, you're not in trouble, but we need to know for our dog's sake what's going on here. And nine times out of ten, they would admit to to go gap, a halt, and go. You're not in trouble, so you're going to walk, you go on. And you use it for a field information. In other words, for, you're basically up eyeing this guy to continue on, and he'll tell you where he hauled it. That's nice, too. But most generally, they won't, but at least he'll tell you, I hauled some dope. Now I know my dog was correct. And, and for our record keeping and the stuff that's required by our courts, that is very important for us to do. To be able to document that I talked to asshole one, and asshole said, yeah, I did hold dope to such and such location, but I don't have no more now. And so I, we would actually tell him, we're not going to go search his house, because I, want, I need this guy to tell me the truth. I need to know what's going on. So it's a very important factor for us to do. Okay, for patrol dogs, we got to have all these drive. Prey drive, hunt drive, play drive, pack drive, fight drive, ramp drive, and defense drive. And we'll talk about the first two on the bottom first. For police service dogs, we do not want, want much defense drive. Everybody understand what defense drive is? The dog's ability to defend himself in a fight. Okay, we want a small amount of it, but not a high amount. Because if we get a high amount of it, everybody's seen these dogs where the hair stands up and the dog's nerves aren't quite right. The dog's like, Bruh, and he's quick to go off on stuff. That's a nerve problem. And so the dog has a lot of defense drive into him. And we can go back and say, if you really want to look at it, if it's high, it's a fear body. You know, for all of you to understand. So we don't want a lot of defense drive. Nor do we want a lot of rank drive. Why do we not want a lot of rank drive? Because we don't want a dog to challenge leadership all the time about what we do. Because if the dog challenges us all the time, that becomes an officer safety issue. So if I'm out on the street working my canine, and I'm in Joe tactical mode here to make sure I'm safe and my backup team is safe, and I got a dog down here, I'm working off leash, and I've got my gun, and I'm moving through whatever, and I've got backup guys back here, and I got a high rank drive dog, and he doesn't flex, and I reach over and go, pop, and hit him because I need to pay attention to what's going on out here, not my dog. I must have a control. And the dog decides, hit me? I don't want to bite your ass. So you got a dog climbing up your arm, and I got videos I can show you of actual, actual scenarios in San Diego where a bad guy was in a building with an AK-47 and he went in there with cops chasing him and he's firing at them in their police cars. He hit several cars, wounded an officer, killed another officer. So they got him held up in the house. Does everybody know what time fire is from SWAT teams? So San Diego SWAT team is out there doing time fire into the house. In other words, they had certain positions all around the house, and they would, they would say, go, green light, boop, 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 and different guys would start shooting through windows and different things into the house, trying to figure out where this guy is, getting him to return fire. And then they pumped in like 23 pounds of gas, and the guy dons a gas mask. He's wearing the same camouflage fatigues that guess who else is wearing? SWAT team. It looks identical to him. This goes on for hours. I, I can show you. I have it on the video. <clears throat> then the bad guy decides, you know what? You cops don't scare me. I'm coming out. And I got a slow motion where he comes out, AK-47, fully automatic, and he's pumping around into an APC, APC sitting right in front of him. And they're shooting him with MP5s and he barely buckles. Because every now and then you see him get hit, he barely buckles. And he just keeps going. Shooting wounds and kills another officer. 
goes down a fence line, and at the fence line, this was the fence line here, right around the corner is a canine unit and a handler, mellow one. He rounds the corner and points the gun at the officer. The officer didn't even know he was coming. So this tells you what kind of clusterfuck this was. Comes around the corner, points the gun, and he's AK jammed. And he's sitting here trying to clear it. You can watch him clearing it. The handler jumps back, pulls his 45 out, and starts shooting at the guy. The dog goes after the handler's arm and is hitting him. The handler pumped out 14 rounds and never hit the guy because the dog's sitting here hitting his arm because the dog was aggressive and jumped on So then another SWAT officer sees what's going on. He runs up there. Shoots this guy with double up butt and knocks him to the ground. And the guy goes down. Then the handler is all fucked up with his lead. You watch him, he's doing all this shit. And he finally gets the dog off leash and, and the dog goes in and bites the guy right here in the collar. And the dog has a bite on him. Another SWAT officer then comes into the scene, walks up with a long rifle right to the head, and goes boom, and shoots this guy in the head. And guess what the dog was? He comes off, starts running around. Who do I bite now? Who do I bite now? It's absolutely a cluster, and we use it for training because that's one of the reasons you don't want aggressiveness to gunfire. You got your dog has to be stable. And this all goes back to this stuff right here: drive, training through drive. We have to train through drive nowadays. Force training or compulsion training. Some of the stuff Matt was talking about. We said the dog's out trying to run a track, but the, the handler has corrected his dog hard. We got pissed off, lost his temper. We all do it. I do it. We all do it. But don't take it out on your dog. Because guess whose fault it is? It's yours. Anytime your dog will not function and do the stuff that your dog has been trained to do, it's your fault. Because the truth is, if most guys would admit it, you say, when's the last time you ran a track? Well, I don't really like tracking, so, I don't know, four months ago. Should be running a track every week. That's what maintenance trains for. That's what your departments give you eight hours, or should be giving you eight hours a week to train. If you have a dual purpose dog. If you have a single purpose dog, you at least should be getting four or six. Minimum. It's a very, very important. But we have to have these drives. We do not want rank. We want fight drive. Now, a lot of people, and if you've been on the internet, you look on the internet and you'll see this big controversy going on in this country. Now, I learned a long time ago, you stay out of this shit. With all these chat rooms from cops on these police sites, the difference between fight drive and defense drive it is very simple if you want to find it. But, you have people across this country that can hide behind computers, that's what I call it, they hide behind a computer and they talk shit. Because no one can tell them. Here's the big thing. Fight drive is the ability of the dog to take some type of pain or stripes and be able to fight his fighting partner. He does not back away. He takes it. Defense drive, the dog is in total defense drive trying to defend himself from a threat. And that's the difference between the two. But what do we want? We want fight drive in a police service dog. So when I send my dog out, you'll hear these stories in your canine career. Seminars you go to all across this country, you'll hear some copper's going to say to you, Jesus Christ, man, I sent my dog out on a bike, and the guy was standing perfectly still like this, and the dog went up and smelled him and turned around and walked away. Why did that happen? That's what happens with finding bike dogs 90% of the time. People have totally lost the miscue why we do detain work. Everybody know what detain is? Simple word is barking hold. Germans developed this back in the 1800s. That's why you see civilians doing it. Should them. That's where it came from. German police developed it. It is not developed to be minimal force to the suspect. It is developed to teach the dog this, fight drive. That's what it's developed for. 
So when the dog comes in and finds a guy on the street, the dog comes in, he's in fight drive. I like to use this demonstration. Remember the old fights? You know, well, you guys might not remember this. I'm old. The old fights, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. Muhammad backing up, throwing punches. And you got Joe Frazier constantly going after him, doing this. Joe Frazier was in fight drive. Muhammad Ali was in what? Flight. But he's punching, but he's still flight. He's fleeing. Police service dog has been trained to do retain work correctly. It is not, and this is where a lot of administrators, a lot of people absolutely lose the train of thought about this. It is not to protect that suspect. It is to be able to give the officer, officer safety, and he knows when his dog found somebody. So when the dog comes in and you got the guy all up doing this shit, the dog comes in, bah, 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 bah. Now, we're, none of us here came over on a banana boat, all right? This guy is not going to do what? He's not going to stand there. He's going to do this. And the minute he does this, what happens? The dog is going to bite. We do it for the alert. It is all done for the alert and officer safety. So when I'm out here working, and my dog finds a suspect, you don't go up to him, smell him, and leave, and then put me in jeopardy. The dog goes up there and starts barking and fight drive. Because the dog has learned, that is my fighting partner. Okay, The dog has learned this. This is my fighting partner. When I find him, I get to fight with him. Now, does the dog need to make a bite? No. The dog has a proper drive, he doesn't need to do that. We do it all the time. When we send a dog in, guys hide behind a door or up high in a building search, dog smells him, dog gets in the odor, dog gets a scent comb, dog gets a scent pitcher, dog will pop, 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 bark, 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 bark. Good boy. We'll go put the leash on him, have a guy show his head, hey, here I am. Dog fires up more, boom, we'll take him out. Okay? The misconception is your dog does not need to bite. That bite was just as good for him as it was to bite some because it's personally satisfied his drive that he found somebody and he got the bark. If they have the right drive. Dogs that don't have the right drive, you'll see in your canine career, you go to seminars, you see some guy doing a building search on leash. And the dog comes over here and finds a guy and he's going, I did it, did it, did it, did it. He's having to do what? Encourage his dog to alert. What is that? That is an officer safety issue. As an administrator, you should be going, that's bullshit. My officer's life is in danger. You do not ever want to have to approach a suspect on the street and sit here and try to, hop to fire your dog up to do something. The dog should be ready to kick it in when it drops. That's what's important. Okay. Now going back to detection dogs. The new style, the new stuff we're doing with the passive alerts and everything else, what's important is that we teach the odors. And here again, we all know dogs don't know what drugs are, right? They know it's an odor. That's all they know. Don't ever, I was in front of a federal court in Wichita in 1982 and swearing on an affidavit search warrant for DEA, and the judge goes, you got to tell me what drug. I don't know what drug. He goes, well, I'll give you a search warrant unless you tell me what drug. That's why my dog's trained on six drugs. Well, what drug did your dog find? <coughs> one of the six? I don't know. It's at a UPS deal. And he goes, well, I'll give you a search warrant unless you can tell me. I said, well, name all six. Nope. You got to tell me. I said, we need to go to Chambers. Because <laughs> we interrupted court. There was a court proceeding going. So we go to Chambers, and I look at the judge, and I go, Your Honor, I'm sorry. My dog doesn't know. He doesn't point at and go, cocaine, Tom, right here. I got it. This is cocaine. He, the dog only finds odors that we've taught him to find. He doesn't know that's it. And you will get, God, people, there are vendors out here, and you'll call them up and go, oh, yeah, I taught my dog scratch one time, it's marijuana, two times it's cocaine. They'll do anything to sell dogs. It's absolute bullshit. But anyway, after I explained it to the judge, he goes, oh, I said, it's like a bird dog, Your Honor. I said, you bird dog hunt? He goes, yes. 
I said, when you go out, do you know it's a pheasant or quail? I don't know. So I said, well, I don't know either. I don't know what drug we have here, but I know we got dope. So we bring it back and, and, and uh, get the, the dope out of this UPS package, and the judge, he's very happy. And, but that's, that's the thing. You don't know. So you, how many people have prepared affidavits except without what you're doing and then things like that in your computer so if you've got something to do all you got to do is go in there and add what's going on print it out and you're ready to roll very important you have this you should have your your dog's uh, basically resume your resume and then the start of the affidavit of what is going on date and time you know, that's all you got to fill in is date and time I search a car, such and such, or house, such and such, such and such residence, and boom, 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 boom. So when you're out here working, that you can do that stuff just like that. Put it in, print it out, and take it to the judge and get it done if you need an affidavit search warrant. How many people's counties or cities rely on to have affidavit search warrants to search a vehicle if they get no consent? You go in on the doll's record? That's very good. That's what you should Okay, getting back to the past. Odor. We've got to teach the odors to the dog. Then we go to the bunny box. The reason we call it a bunny box is because that's exactly what it is. The dog learns his natural instinctual drives. He goes in, he smells the odor that we've been teaching him. And inside this box is a person as well. Now remember, about scent pincher, what do we say? If someone's in that box, what does the dog smell too? A person. And each one of us is our own fingerprint. If I eat uh, a lot of seafood, if I eat and use a certain cologne or a certain aftershave, the dog smells all that too. Each one of us. And what, whatever race you are, the dog smells different smells because that is the truth about the fact. Different races smell different than other races. How many of you walked into a house and it's, uh, or you have a dog and you're Caucasian and a black person walks up and the dog starts going off on it for no reason at all. And the dog ain't ever been trained because that person smells different. Dogs react to smell. So we have the, the little bunny box here, and the person, we say bunny out, and they put the ball out, and the dog goes, hmm, because that's his bunny wrap. And so now we've got to get the sit stable, so we're stabilizing the sit, and the bunny goes and does a couple flybys. As soon as the dog is focused good, the bunny flies out. And the dog gets to do what? Kill it. Because leadership allowed that to happen. So the dog kills it. We play with it a while. We get the ball away. Dog, the ball goes back in. Dog gets to smell the odor again. Boom. And he starts focusing. This is what we're after here. Bunny box, alert box, stable in the sit, or aggressive. You can do this with aggressive alert dogs too. It doesn't matter. And the main thing we're after is focus. One of the things Matt was talking about on track was what? He talked about a lieutenant on South Dakota Highway Patrol that managed his track because the dog had focus. And so he was able to read his dog and manage that track all the way through and become a master track. Very important. So we need the same thing with our detection dog. We have to have the focus. So if my dog goes in and sits, and alerts, I can walk away from him, I can go over here, try to get him to come to me, and the dog says, well, shit, it's right here. So my dog stays right there. My dog is totally focused to the pond, and I walk away. And that gives me confidence to tell my administration then, I got dope right here, and I need a search warrant or whatever we want to do. Or if I already have a search warrant, great. But that's what I need to have. This other thing is so important with, with detection dogs, and this is where officers run into problems all the time, and we're going to do a lot of it here at this seminar for you that have detection dogs, is proofing. How many guys always call me up, Jesus Christ, I was searching this guy's car, he had tamales and burritos in the back, and my dog started snarfing down. Why'd that happen? Because the dog's allowed to do it. That's why. You have to put proofs out to make sure if it's a dope dog, your dog only finds dope. If it's a bomb dog, your dog only finds bomb. 
you should be able to take in this little room right here, put three bomb finds out in here, and put three narc finds out in here. And if you got a narc dog running through and he totally, totally disregards bombs, but he didn't train no bomb. He shouldn't be listening, paying attention to that. If he starts hitting bombs, why is it? Anybody tell me? Because the dog is very good at what? Evidence searches. Because human scent is on the bomb too. So the dog comes up to that bomb, big old whiff, vacuums in, vacuum in all these molecules, and it goes, human scent? Yep, that's Tom. And I don't know that one, but that's Tom, so I know that one's correct. Ooh, since he's out of scent. And we go, wow, the dog's hitting bombs now. <laughs> he's not hitting bombs. He's hitting the human scent to put it out. So one of the things we have to do in our proofs is we have to proof off human scent. We have to proof off dog odors, feces, balls, toys that they use, their bunny rabbits, <clears throat> whether, whether it's a hose, whether it's PVC, whether it's a ball, that's a bunny. So we have to proof off that. We have to proof off food items. Uh, if you're using any type of pseudo cocaine or pseudo heroin or anything like that, you got to proof off of aspirins, powdered aspirins, because 80 some percent of that mixture that customs design when they design pseudo is powdered aspirin. Okay, cutting agents. One of the things you want to find out and always look at when you go do your dope. If you find dope out here, marijuana, of course, you don't need to worry about it. But if you find a white powdery uh, substance and you send it off to your lab and it comes back cocaine, ask them to find out the purity so you know. And ask them to find out what the cutting is so you know. If it's instantol or isotol or baking soda or powdered sugar, whatever it might be, you need to know to proof off of it. Why? Because again, we go back to the scent picture. The scent picture, the dog smells it, and it's got instantol or isotol or baking soda in it, the dog goes, yep, I don't know how I smell, but I do now. Because my handler did what? <clears throat> Threw the ball. Gave the dog the bunny. That's why on the street we never alert. I mean, we never give the signalization. It's a no-no. And for those of you, not only is it a no-no for the scent picture factor, which is the most important factor, uh, there's been several departments that lose dogs on I-70 because they did what? The dog indicated and they go, and they threw the ball. And it was a Kong ball. And what is a Kong ball? Go over. Ball bounced out into the highway. Dog don't know about cars. Dog runs out on the highway to get his ball. Gets ran over. Dead dog. So, that's another thing that you don't want to do. All right, now we're going to do a little bit. Some of you guys wanted me to talk a little bit about some uh, interdiction, and I'm going to also, where's Tracy? Also, have Tracy come up here. He's one of the best interdiction officers in the country. He has more fines than probably anybody, and uh, he's a uh, instructed at desert snow and different things like that. He's awesome. But one of the main things you have to do in interdiction is you've got to be a good bullshitter, is number one. You got to, and what, what happens when we're a good bullshitter, when we're out there talking to people, is we sometimes do what? We let our safety down. We sometimes let our safety down when we're, when we're dealing with these people. So always remember, no matter how much you want to get a load, no matter how much you will try to do this or that, you must still remember you've got to be safe. Too many officers are getting themselves killed or shot out here or beat up because they're not being safe. The, the different things that are going on now that some of the officers have ran into, and especially in Texas they've ran into this, is these guys not only have the mule hauling the dope, they've got a protection car coming up behind them. And they'll go on by you as you stop it, and they'll go down and turn around and watch you. And when they see that a dog's coming or something like that, uh, for you that, that belong to Epic and stuff, you should be reading this. They'll come by and fire it. They will kill the mule and kill the cop and take the load and go. 
and they don't care. And it's happened in Texas quite a bit. DPS officers down there and sheriff's office. Tracy, you want to talk to them a little bit about what you do out there in Kiowa County? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're an undersheriff now. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good, so you have to get up here and talk. Yeah. Uh, so they know where to start. Why don't you start with some of the things you guys look for and what you do on 54 and, and stuff like that? Well, everybody, uh, I think everybody knows Highway 54 is one of the, the main highways running from El Paso. Kansas City, Chicago, so there is a lot of narcotics. Uh, I've been in Kiowa County for five years, been a dog handler almost the whole five years there. Um, our biggest biggest drug going through there right now is marijuana. We do have a lot of cocaine and, and meth getting heavy on. Interdiction. Uh, Probably the biggest thing we do there. Um, once you go through your approach to the car, uh, questions you ask them. Yeah. Uh, the big thing I look for is you got your um, single males, single females. Um, that's one of our biggest. Or, or you get a, say, 70 year old male and a 20 year old male in the same vehicle. When I approach a car, stop a car, I go up, ask the driver to step out, talk to them, um, ask them simple questions. The, the biggest thing in interdiction is, especially on a busy highway, you're going to need to stop a lot of vehicles, talk to a lot of people. Um, and if you spend 20, 30 minutes on the stop and then realize there's nothing here, there's other bills going by. So my big deal is I want to get out. Ask them a few questions real fast. I know pretty quick by their answers if they are hauling drugs. Um, if they are, then I want to spend my time and go a little deeper into it. If not, I kick them loose. I don't write many tickets. Um, shoot, I can tell you how many I've actually wrote, but not many. I get to a car, even if I stop them for 80, I walk up, ask them the questions. If it's nothing, I say slow down, have a good day, and kick them loose. Because I want to hit the next car. Yeah, stop for everything you can. Tag lights, tail lights, uh, crossing the white line, anything. As soon as you get it, stop them, get up, make your contact, and get going. The questions you want to ask is right off the bat is where are you going? How long are you going to be there? Um, why are you going there? Um, if you got two people in the vehicle, you, like I said, I separate them before I ask that question. Just have them step out real quick, grab the driver's license, get them away from the other person, ask them real quick that question. They start telling me, well, I'm going to, to New York. Um, how long am I going to be there? I'm going to be there a day. Everybody knows that's bullshit. So that's when I want to want to start going further. Um, then I go up and I ask them, I said, well, I need to go check your VIN number with your registration. While I'm up there, I'm talking to the passenger. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? You get those indicators, they start telling, oh, we're going to, to New York. Well, I'm going to be there. Oh, we're going for a week. You know, another guy tells you a day. Then I want to go a little bit further. Um, one thing we do find that's different than I-70, um, most of our drugs are in compartments. Uh, we are hitting a few that, you know, suicide loads, we call them. Um, but most of them are in compartments. We're on I-70, they're stopping people popping trunks in their duffel bag. Ours are, are hid, so that's where the canine comes into play. Um, but without your dog, you know, they're, and especially if they tell you, hell no, you ain't searching, you gotta have your dog, and that's where, you know, it comes back to Tom, trusting your dog. I get my dog out of the car, I run him around it, he hits, I walk him right back, put him up, and then I go to him. I, I don't reward him, uh, which I've learned that from Tom over the years, but, once you get that, then you go into tearing the car apart. We have to, in our area of Troy, you can verify it's, the compartments are a big thing there. 54 and, and, and 50 and M highways always going to be in compartments. Because that is all coming out of Mexico. A lot 
lot of stuff that comes up on I-7 that's coming out of California or already Arizona, stuff like that, and it's still coming back, it's going back. We found down there that probably 95%, I would say, is in your gas tanks, your tires, your bolts, and parts. That's what the Hispanics do. Another thing they do is that I want to hit on, and Tracy go back to what I was talking about, is they have purchased drug dogs. The Mexican Mafia has purchased drug dogs in Mexico, and they will check their load before it leaves with a drug dog. But one of the things they forget is they're still traveling. So if they travel and drive, it creates vacuum releases, which allows us to smell our dogs to smell as they go on. But they do check their loads. Yeah. And they then they pay big money for welders because a lot of it, you know, their welding compartments in there. The Mexican drug cartel pays a lot of money for a guy that thinks he knows how to weld. So. And like Tom said, they'll go around their dogs and the dogs don't hit, okay, it's good, get out of here. But, you know, you travel a thousand miles, go shift and little air pockets. Um, some of the things that I've found um, compartment-wise, uh, spare tires, uh, they're, they're big. Uh, I think actually driving on the tires. We've got those. Tom's got some pictures. Um, gas tanks are big in, in our area. Uh, drive shafts. Uh, and they're hiding it everywhere. Uh, actually yeah. one of the one of the best ones that I have to say about my dog, uh, I got called to Ford County one one uh, evening, the deputy there called me over, said he had a guy from uh, Arizona going to Cleveland, Ohio. And he said, something's just not right with him. Will you come over and bring your dog? I said, sure. So, um, row there, run the dog. Dog indicated on the door, the driver's door. Brought him around, jumped in the back of the truck and indicated in the on the driver's side tailgate area. So put my dog up. We searched, of course, the cab first. Um, find his personal use meth. Thinking, all right, that's cool. Throw him in. Or, uh, Cuff him up, throw him in a patrol car, and we're standing there and start searching the back of this truck. We searched for probably three hours, tore this truck apart, nothing. Took the tires off, had the deputy heading into town, break the tires down, we were trying to figure out why my dog, um, and that was one of the big things, trust your dog. If I wouldn't have trusted my dog, we'd have let this load go, but I knew there was something there. Um, look back, the guy, he's sweating. It's a cold evening, windows down in the truck, and he's just pouring sweat. So I get in and threw bullshit with him and, and tricked him, actually. Um, he told me where it was at. It was in the intake manifold of his truck. Driving down the highway, car broke down. But what happened, once we removed the, the engine to get to the intake, they had three keys of Coke in there. One of the packages come loose in the, the drive, and the dog was hitting the tailpipe. The odor was coming through through the tailpipe. So that's where, if I wouldn't have trusted my dog, we'd have missed it. Um, so always trust your dog and they, it's there. Um, and sometimes, sometimes your dog might not hit exactly where source is because of what he's talking about right there. Okay, coming down that tailpipe, that's the biggest part of source. So coming out the tailpipe, that's where the dog works. So they do the best job that they could possibly do. Never just stop right there and say, stop thinking and using common sense. Coming out the tailpipe, wow. Maybe I better go look at the engine compartment or in the front of the, the uh, dashboard. Or in the dash, a lot of times use that for false compartment. Because that is exactly what can happen. And, you know, and then that one was, was a pretty good the guy, uh, after interviewing him, he, uh, he's all three loads to uh, Ohio and uh, and had dogs search his car, his truck, never found it. Uh, he's actually hauled money on the way back in that man, same manifold. Um, so, and that's a tool, just one quick on the Dodge, it's a Dodge pickup, uh, and Dodges have vacuum hose on each side of the intake manifold. There's, they're little bitty hoses. As an interdiction officer, carry you a rod real small, real heavy, and you can actually pull those hoses off, one on each side, and stick your rod through, and it'll come out the other side. If it does not, you 
more likely to have something in there blocking it. And that was one way we could tell after this. Uh, and we did do some research and found that Trooper on 70 had actually got compartments just like that. But uh, I've only found that on Dodge as far as my personal experience. But uh, what's some of the uh, equipment they need to carry? Um, well, some of the things I carry, I do have fiber optic scope. Um, we went down to Florida and had the uh, scope given to us. Uh, and it actually has a, it's a complete package with the scope and density meter. Um, you also have rods that I was talking about you can throw together and stick through. Um, but a fiber optic scope is, is one of your best friends, just like your dog is. You got a compartment in the gas tank, your dog's hitting on it. Well, the only way you're going to do it as an administrator, you start having your handler taking gas tanks down and dropping them. It gets kind of expensive, so your dog hits on it, whip the scope out, throw it in there. Um, I can say from experience, there's times that even with the scope, you can't see it, but uh, but most of the time you can. Uh, you can throw that scope in and see weld marks, things like that inside the tanks. So. You carry like battery operated uh, drill. drill with all your different go to your like O'Reilly's or Van Thought or whatever. Find out because all the new cars have all these little different star things and stuff that you need to use to be able to take them apart. I know my guys also carry a creeper. Yep. Uh, we wore BDUs. That was one of the things that my administration and I argued for years. You know, we had us wearing the, the, the traditional sheriff uniform that was required by state statute at the time with the French blue and the dark blue pants. And we're out there ripping our uniforms up and the shirts were about 10, 60 some bucks a piece, the pants were 50 some. And finally I said, you know what, let's go to BDUs. And, and the best ones to get is what OP is wearing here. I think yeah. you guys have two, Johnson County, the Bratwood, yeah. your department will get them for you. They're very expensive, but they're guaranteed for life. And we had them, because we were crawling underneath cars. We also, in my area, we worked the port, which is port entry coming into, from Oklahoma into our state. So we had all the semi-trucks as well, as, as well as motor homes and different things like that. So it's important to have creepers, your battery-operated stuff, make sure your batteries are staying charged. Uh, have your gas tank scopes. That, that stuff is free on burn grants. You just file for them. You go to Florida, you go to Phoenix. And they'll send you down there, they pay the officer's salary, they pay for all his training, they pay for everything. They teach you down there and can get you a gas tank scope, density meter, and another thing to carry is a stethoscope. Yeah. Uh, in the desert snow, how they teach you how to use that? Yeah, um, the desert snow, they teach, you know, everybody's been there, but you put your, your uh, stethoscope on the tire and you bang it with something hard, and you can actually tell if there's something in there by the ping noise. It doesn't ping. It's an object's blocking the, the way that you're hitting the, the car. sound doesn't go through to the other end of the tire. Yeah. It stops and makes a thud. It tells you you've got something in there reflecting that in the tire. Another thing to look for is the weights on the inside of the tires. The Hispanics are smart to the fact that, that you will hardly see any weights on the outside of the tires as they balance the next one. Make a, you see some of the pictures up here if I got up there with my dog. It makes a metal railing, it goes into the tire, and allows it to carry 25 pounds, 25 pounds or 23 in each tire. Yeah. So they're 100 pounds right there. And go down the road at 70 miles an hour with balanced tires because they make this metal railing that goes inside the wheel, and then the pound bricks just set in there as they go around. And then they put the weights on the inside of the tire, and that's going to be your, your first clue when you see that. There'll be big weights. This is the only way they can balance the tire. So always look at the inside of the tires. Anything else on that? Uh, the one thing I can say on that, that we've, we've had those loads uh, with cash. Desert Snow teaches that if you don't hear the pin, it's not there. <coughs> That's not actually true. Because uh, we did have 100, I think it was 119,000 cash wrapped around a bike tire in a spare uh, that didn't make the ping and it or it had the ping to it and also a density meter didn't pick up. So don't just 
flip your density meter out and run it around the edge and just say, oh, it's good and go on. Um, we actually found a compartment in this vehicle that was empty, so we took a little more time and ended up grabbing my knife and cutting the spare tire apart and found the money that way. But uh, well, when you get good, you can do that. Yeah. You get yeah, a lot of administrators, you'll be saying, man, I need to do it. And they'll go, oh, no, you ain't doing shit. Yeah, and you'll get yeah. administrators. And don't go home and say, oh, hell, we're all right. Tracy said I could cut tires. <laughs> but, uh, so that's one of the yeah. things you want to remember is in administration sometimes, they're going to look at the factor of lawsuit and liability process. So, so and I was in administration when I retired, and Tracy's now in administration, finding out the hard way about this stuff. <laughs> as, as, you, as you grow, you always, things happen. So one of the things you want to remember on interdiction is what Tracy's talking about. It's not all, you have to be good at what you do. So there's some skill involved. And I recommend to everybody here, if you haven't been to Desert Snow and you're running interdiction, you need to go to Desert Snow. It's probably one of the best schools in this country. Don't go to your highway patrol and listen to them. I'll tell you that right now. They put on one of the poorest drug interdiction classes there is. So. Any troopers in here? I didn't mean to offend. Yeah. But Desert Snow is an awesome, awesome school. So go to it if you get. It is rather expensive, but it's yeah. worth every penny. My guys, once they got to go to Desert Snow, they got a lot more loads. They got a lot more stuff. And, and this is where Tracy talks about. Don't always believe what's going on. I'm gonna tell you a little story. One night, John Schnorr and myself were sitting at 54 Pancake Boulevard in Liberal, freaking Kansas. Have any of you ever been there? That is the shithole of the world. And uh, 3.30 in the morning, we see this guy in the station wagon pull up the stop right there. I look at the tag, I run it, comes back out of El Paso. We were just getting ready to go home. I go, man, let's, let's check this car. He goes, yeah, man. Asshole didn't do anything wrong, but we stopped him anyway. This is the way it goes. When you're out with the hoot owls, you can do that. So we stop him, because we only had a mile and a half from that intersection, and he's in Oklahoma. But it just looked really good. So we pull him over, I go up, and as I walked up and approached the vehicle, there was no panels left on his car. All the panels on the in exterior, interior of the car were off and laying on the ground. I mean, laying in the, on, on the floorboards of the car. And I go, holy shit, this is good. So I'm talking to Jose, and Jose's telling me, yeah, well, he's in Minnesota, and they searched his his car with the dog he tore all the panels off because the dog alerted. And he just shows me his warning tickets from the Minnesota Highway Patrol and says, but I had nothing. So why what do you want from me? I said, well, I don't worry about it. Just go down there in the ditch and sit there. So we shake him down, make sure he has nothing on him, get my dog out and work it. My dog goes into the back of the station wagon, right where the carpet is, right over the gas tank, and starts scratching. I go, holy shit. This guy's sitting down there and he's looking and look away, look and look away. I said, go cuff him. So John goes down and cuffs him. We put my dog up. Their dog did the same thing. But they only took the panels off. We pulled the carpet up. That's where your, uh, what do they call it, the valve? Your fuel valve is. Dropped the gas tank, 175,000 in cash. We're loading. Compartment, same place where the dope was. And he's hauling it back. So we sent him a nice letter thanking him for not dropping the gas tank. Because he's not sure. 